when the world has got you down. Alzheimer's sucks. It's an equal opportunity disease that chips away at everything we hold dear. And to date, there's no cure. So until there is, we continue to fight with the most powerful tool in our arsenal, love. This is Love Conquers Alls, a real and really positive podcast that takes a deep dive into everything Alzheimer's, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And now, here are your hosts, Susie Singer-Carter and me, Don Priest. Hello, everybody. I'm Susie Singer-Carter. And I'm Don Priest, and this is Love Conquers Alls. It is. How you doing, Donald? I'm uh, again, you know, I wake up every morning and I'm alive and winner. That's it. The bar is so <laughs> low <winner> now. Chicken <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's that's that, you know, we get there. That's first step. And yeah. then after that, it's all icing on the cake. It really is like it's all about the little things. Like I just found out that my um, my Internet speed is is I'm like I'm like a superstar. Wow. And I just feel like congratulations about that. I have hot, I have a quick internet speed. That's amazing. We're very needy. This this yeah. COVID's made us very needy needy needy. Yeah. People. But I do have something exciting. We have something very exciting today. We have an amazing guest, uh, a go girl, as I told her she is. And um, you know, another another uh Alzheimer's champion, warrior, advocate, all everything all above. And so excited. She's a newly, uh, well, I'm going to let Don introduce her. So yeah. I'll just shut my mouth right now. <laughs> Absolutely. We are today. Our special, special guest is Senator Monique Limon. Uh, she's a newly elected member of the California State Senate representing District 19. And uh, women's issues are a priority for Monique. Uh, as a former commissioner of the Santa Barbara County Commission for Women, she helped connect private and public resources with women in the community. And after you know almost a decade, Monique's grandmother, uh, she lost her battle with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And Monique believes that Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging and we must continue to support the research to find a cure. Uh, her work uh, advancing healthcare access earned her the 2017 Legislator of the Year recognition by the Alzheimer's Association of California. She's amazing. She's wonderful. And we want you to meet her now. Let us bring in Senator Monique Lemon. Hello. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Don. Hello. Thank welcome. You. Congratulations, you go girl, you, you amazing uh, <laughs> Wonder Woman, you. We need more. We need more people like you, you know, talking Alzheimer's. I could not believe that. I was so pleased when Biden actually said it in his speech. I was just like, hallelujah. Thank you. Somebody, somebody on the top recognized this disease. Absolutely. That's super important just to even acknowledge uh, that there's work to be done in the space as opposed to you know, kind of have it in the background and not, you know, publicly talk about the need to do more. So yes, I feel you, Susie. I was saying 100%, the same thing. I literally got chills. I said, did he, wait, did he just say that? Did he say Alzheimer's? Maybe we're, maybe we're getting it out there little by little, like we're through the pebble in the water and it's go, you know, it's reverberating. So hooray, you know, cause it's such a slow process. I understand that your grandmother had lived with the disease for almost a decade. And I, I so relate to that. My mother is going on her 15th year. So uh, hanging in and it's, it's a, it, it can be such a slow disease. This is the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because there isn't enough uh, focus on this disease of being a crisis and especially a financial crisis that we're facing. And by the, by the, you know, by the grace of God, my mother is still living in an amazing place, but you know, we, we, you know, a long, what, about five years ago, her money was spent. And, you know, that is because it's a very expensive disease to uh, support. And so, as you, as you know. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think you're right in recognizing that, um, one, it's long, right? That, um, that, you know, potentially we don't, we don't always know um, what's happening. And sometimes we attribute it to just, oh, well, someone's older, they forget a little bit more. Um, and so a lot of the work I've done has been around education to actually try to identify, well, what's a general, you know, everyday normal forgetting versus like, hold on, there's some repeated patterns here that are no longer part of just like, I just happen to forget. 
Um, and I think that the other piece is that we have so many people, not just in the state of California, but in our nation who are uh, getting it, who are being diagnosed um, with Alzheimer's um, and dementia. And I say, and I often, you know, talk about both because uh, very often it starts with dementia and then leads later on to Alzheimer's, right? We can't always detect Alzheimer's at very, 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 very early stages. Um, but you, you can start to see that there's this really correlation there um, be between the both of them. I know that in California, we expect millions of people over the next decade uh, to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I oftentimes think like, how do we all do it? How do we do it? Uh, individually, like, I mean, you know, Susie, for you, you, you take care of your mother. Like, how do we do it? It's hard. It is. It's hard, hard work. Hard it's emotional. It's someone. expensive. We're not educated to do it. It's so it's like a, a learn as you go. And, you know, and, and which is so unfair. We, we need to understand it, which is why we, Don and I did a, a movie on it, which is why we are here continuing the conversation because I didn't know a thing about it until my mom got it. And most like, people do not no. they just, because it's not something you plan for. It's not something that you're going to be learning in school and saying, hey, by the way, <laughs> you know, it just that, that that education does not exist. It's also yeah. been stigmatized, which I actually I experienced it. I was trying to protect my mom on the early stages like you were speaking about, you know, like that I didn't want her her to be embarrassed you know, as opposed to just embracing it and saying, oh, my mom has Alzheimer's, the beginnings of it, and that this is how it, it manifests. Right, yeah, and, and I think that that's, there, there are so many reasons why it's not, you know, out in the public, why we don't always talk about it, why not everybody knows how to detect it, um, but, you know, among those are everything mm -hmm. that you've mentioned, uh, but we also see the data, though, uh, especially in my role as a state senator, having served four years on the health committee, um, you know, we look at the data and we see the data and we also, we very much recognize that it's no longer a little family here, a little family there that's dealing with it. We're really talking about um, the masses that are gonna deal with it. And um, it's become a health concern also for the state and our nation. Because when we talk about dealing with it, it's as you've described, how do we pay for it? How do we provide care? How do we detect it? How do we do education and outreach around it? Um, and what happens when all of those resources aren't plentiful? When you have a, you know, a crisis of a lack of resources, lack of facilities, lack of yeah. affordability, um, lack of care, and um, that then becomes a greater issue. I think sometimes because we attribute it to someone who is in older age, um, we tend to think it's an issue or a problem I don't need to deal with. Um, until I get there or until later on, until a family member gets there. But the, the challenge is, is that when they get there, they've really gotten there um, and there's no prep time. You just start working and caring for, you know, your loved one immediately. Whether and, you know um, how to or not, no whether you way. know how to not, right? And the exactly. effect has, is, is mm -hmm. you know, it's not just one person. It's not just the person who has it. It affects everyone in the family. It affects, uh -huh. you know, on, on an emotional, a financial, yeah. uh, a physical level because, you know, the caregivers are, are you know, they're, they're almost more affected than the, you know, they're, they're dying off they are. than people with Alzheimer's. Yeah. And so that, so for somebody who's in a position in government, which is, you know, we can, we always say, oh, well, maybe we'll just let the government fix it. Well, that's not so easy, I'm sure, as <laughs> you're well aware of, but we need that because this is affecting our entire community. It affects everybody in the long run. Well, there needs to be some, it's, it's, it's systemic, you know, and I think that it, it needs for me, one of the things that I'm advocating for is is, is change within our uh, court system, with family in the family arena. Because I had to go to court for my mom, and I, it was the most frustrating thing I've ever had to do. And and you know, after three visits, three times, you know, court in front of the judge, finding out each and every time I had no standing as her conservator of person. And yeah, and so it becomes your your hands are tied. You have, we really need to figure out how to reform that too, because that's so important. To, you know, if you can't control their finances and someone else has control of their finances, and it's it's a whole McGillicuddy. <laughs> it is, and and these are these are the issues 
that come up for individuals and for families immediately. There's not really a buffer zone. Once you start, um, you know, in the arena of family caretaking, all of these issues come up um, and they become very difficult. And so much so that the individual, you know, sometimes has to make decisions or has to have, uh, you know, ways to think about all of this. So I think that that's absolutely one of the challenges that we see. Um, what, what happens when you're not able to care? Um, what happens when you don't have those resources or that information? What does that look like? It looks terrible, I'll tell you, because I tried to make use of the resources that were out there. And, you know, I was, I, I, I went to every, every platform, every organization that, that said they provided it. And, and, and although they, 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 I'm not, I'm not discounting what they offered. It was not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what we see no matter, no, even when you find resources, it's not enough. So I oftentimes think about my grandmother and my grandmother um, had 12 children or, you know, my aunts and uncles and my mom um, who were able to provide 24 hour around the clock care. That's 12. That's rare. That's Um, very rare. Right. But that's 12. Um, We don't oftentimes see that. I can, you know, my mom and dad have me and my brother. And I can tell you right now that there is not a way that we would be able to provide that care. Um, even after, you know, it, it's one thing to be able to do it on a, on a day or two, another thing to be able to do it over a decade. And 24 um, hours when a, day, a lot yeah. of even, yeah. 24 hours a day, that's, that's, that's where it becomes really difficult. And so we did end up as a family, um, you know, seeking support with a caretaker. It was just a lot. And I think you also touch upon the fact that it's a financial issue, but it's also, a, you know, just a mental, uh, you know, emotional issue as well. It's difficult to care for someone who is aging and who is, you know, not always at 100%. Um, and so those are things that are really difficult for families to do. And that has an impact, um, not just on that individual, but also on the community, the family at large. And the economy. And, and yeah, it's hard enough even, I mean, for trained professionals, it's very, very difficult in a facility that's, that's geared for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I remember when, when Susie's mom was, Susie had her live with her for a year, for a year um, and she would, she had hired care, I mean, trained professionals to come in and help and they were quitting because they couldn't <laughs> handle it. You know, these these were people. That's what they were there to do, and they they were supposedly trained in Alzheimer's, you know, patients. And they were like, I yeah, I can't I can't deal with. I'm this. leaving. So, I'm leaving. Well, imagine too what hard. it's like on a family <laughs> member. You know, it's yeah. it's impossible. Yeah, it's very right. It's absolutely. It's very difficult, and oftentimes the family, you know, members aren't also the trained professionals. Um, and so when you have someone who's not a trained professional doing it, it, it could be even harder on that individual than on the trained professional who has an expertise. Yes. And so we do need champions like you. And, and I wanted to just, I want to, first of all, just say thank you again. And in 2019, you presented a, a piece of legislation, the Healthy Brain Initiative. And um, do you want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So in the California state legislature, I've had the opportunity in 2017, 2018, 2019, and even this year in 2020, Um, I put forward a bill every year related to Alzheimer's. Um, And a lot of the focus has been trying to actually get more financial resources um, for for the outreach, for the education, for the training. Um, And in 2019, we were successful in putting the Healthy Brains Initiative forward, um, which ended up being, um, it, it started off as a legislative bill, a policy bill, but then it turned into a budget bill uh, which allowed for funding to go to our continuums of cares in the counties to be able to do more outreach in relation to early prevention and early um, detection, mm-hmm. which I think is so, so important um, for families. The sooner we can get them that information, the sooner they know what to look for, um, the sooner that we can at least tie them into the, you know, the few resources that are available, the better it is for the individual that has Alzheimer's or dementia, but also for the family. So that's, we were successful in getting, um, you know, funding for that. Um, It came in the form of a few million dollars. And that was something that was really important for our state. This year, I've introduced 
Senate Bill 48, which is a bill that uh, would uh, require that our physicians have four hours of training um, related to Alzheimer's, dementia, and aging care. Uh, I think that that's also another element that's important. It's becoming such an issue for our, uh, the dementia Alzheimer's is becoming such an issue for our state and our nation that um, having that as be part of a training, how to identify, how to secure, how to work with uh, patients in terms of making sure they have the right information. So we'll be moving that bill forward. And it's something that um, I've been very committed I to. Love- uh, sometimes people look at me and say like, why you, right? Why are you? so interested in and they said it's yeah, personal. it has to be personal that's what makes anything that's personal is what drives us right i mean that's absolutely it, it makes the best media it makes the best storytelling it's it resonates i'm and so then, happy you're doing i'm sorry to cut you off don i'm so passionate about what that's you're okay doing. enjoy <laughs> <laughs> no it's just that you know my, my it's so important to educate doctors you know all doctors even if it's not there especially if they're not in geriatrics because you know, my mother, uh, when she when I moved her to a facility, she ended up having to go in for a uh, a checkup, and and she got agitated because she didn't know where she was, and she started, you know, they they misinterpreted it as as um, something um, mentally unstable and put her in lockup for o- almost seven days because the doctor that admitted her thought didn't know she had Alzheimer's and didn't and drugged her look and drugged her with a drug that you should never give anybody with dementia. And um, that became, that that was the beginning of her being incontinent and, ne- and, and immobile. She never got out of a wheelchair. She never walked again after that. And she was walking like five miles a day before yeah. that. And know? if it wasn't for her, her geriatric doctor, when he finally got to see her and said, do you know she's on Depica? And I was like, cause I thought she was declining. Like I thought I was gonna lose her that year. She was like a zombie. No, it was the drug that they put her on, Depakot, which is for like highly black you know, label drug. Yeah, the black <laughs> label drug. And he said, you got to get her off of that. I said, and that's due to lack of education on the, you know, and also first responders. Yeah, first, first responders, responders have to, you know, they do, they don't know what they're, you know, dealing with, and because there's no training in that respect, is that part of the the bill also, as far as the first responder? So, education? so. First responders aren't part of the bill at this moment, but certainly these are the conversations that influence how we move some of this forward. Um, I think, you you know, you're right. And you're speaking to the fact that um, it's the early detection, right? How do you identify between uh, what could potentially be some other mental health issues, but it's not really always that, right? But how, how do we make that distinction? And most of us in the state and most of us in our country are not trained to make that distinction. Um, and certainly our, as family members and others, we won't be trained um, immediately, but I think it's something to be super aware of and to, you know, to, to, to get as much information out there so that we have some context, some understanding. Indeed, and you know, even with, within my family, when I, my mom and I were best friends, I adore her and like, I just love her bit. And my, I knew her personality and I had to started to detect differences early on. Right. And I kept saying to my family, you know, my brother and my stepfather, and I was saying something's wrong, something's off and no, and people don't want to address it for many reasons. They're frightened. They, they may not care <laughs> they, or they, you know, it, it, it triggers things inside themselves that they don't want to look at. So um, they, everyone was like, you're crazy. Stop. You're being over, you know, stop, stop analyzing it, you know, and it was me that brought her to the doctor and had her memory tested because I knew there was something off and, you know, and that's, the, it's another issue. So if we can start education younger, we need to start with children so that, you know, in a very, you know, uh, appropriate way, but teaching them what that looks like. So they're not afraid of it. Yeah. And, and that's a good point too. Um, when sometimes as humans, when we don't know what it is, we could become afraid of something, right? It's not just the little ones, um, but you know, if you don't know what it is, if you don't know what's happening, if something seems different or abnormal, um, there's this fear of what, well, what is happening, yeah. right? Maybe something is wrong um, and, and not knowing what it could be, not knowing uh, you know, what surrounds it, I think it'd be difficult. So absolutely, I think you're absolutely right in all of those points that it's uh, the, 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 what, whatever we can do to ensure that people have a way to think about this differently and not be fearful, but also start to try to help 
the individual who has this, but also themselves as soon as possible, because it's a long journey. Uh, it's a long and because, journey. And because of that, that long journey, it, it brings up, and I know that's part of your, your bill, is is the financial. I mean, th uh, the average, you say $340,000 is an, is an average bill you will get after that somebody with Alzheimer's. Most people do not have that. Some people say, well, I have a home and I'll just sell it. It's like, well, that money disappears so quickly. Don't know so how quickly. long it's going to last. And it brings up the, the problem of not only the monthly care, but you know, the fact that we, <laughs> because we don't know how long it will be, you can't plan for it. And is the solution, is it, is government the solution? What, what is the solution? Because the individual is, once they're out of money, they're out of money. No, Susie's mother and Susie are very fortunate that she's in the Jewish home and they have a program for people when they, for some people, and it's very few who, who are allowed. Basically a lottery. There. It's basically, basically she's, she's supported for the rest of her life. With and, Medicare. But that's so rare. If, if she didn't have that right now, she would be in a, uh, I guess, a, 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 state, medic, a, a state, state facility, medical. which are not good well they're overrun they're overrun <laughs> they're, they're not no. they're not supported enough so, they don't have enough they don't have enough resources that's so the what is what is the meaning it is a societal issue so is it something that government should be you know at least taking care of because because even even uh long-term insurance it doesn't cover any i mean my father had long-term insurance that was supposed to cover him for the rest of his life if and when he needed it and suddenly they said no we'll only cover up to $140,000 and then you're on your own. Right, and I think from my perspective as a legislator, um, the solution is multifaceted. We don't put this all on the family, all on government, all on the insurance, all on anything, right? Um, it has to be multifaceted because the issue is so big. Um, and I think, you know, Susie, you described where you have, um, you know, the, the Jewish community, I'm guessing it's a sort of nonprofit of sorts. Oh, no, it's full on it? profit. It, here's the thing. <laughs> full they have a lot of donors. The Jewish home is, 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 is here in, in Los Angeles. They do earmark a certain percentage of, of their nonprofit side of it. They do have a, a they do have a, a, I guess, a, an arm of it, which is nonprofit. And, and it's basically, you know, I begged and pleaded and, you know, I, did, I just stayed on them and they were like, shut up. Okay. Okay. But I mean, really waiting list, you know, there could be a three year waiting list, list, list which in those three years, what happens? So Senator, I, as a, as a, as a daughter of Alzheimer's, I know how fortunate I am. And that's why I want to do this podcast. That's why I want to talk to people like you so that someone doesn't end up in a position like me panicking and going and then actually not having any place to take the person that they love. So I think that, for, you know, on the part of government, I feel like, you know, for government, we really do need to look at ways that we can support um, first and foremost, you know, the patient, um, but also the family members. So whether that means, you know, early detection or having more resources, more, you know, if you think of the people who sometimes are able or not able to meet with you to come to your home, pre-COVID mm -hmm. obviously, um, but, you know, to, to work with the family, um, to identify what are those, you know, the equivalents of the Jewish, you know, home, um, the, you know, the Jewish house in other counties. Um, that's where I think it becomes really difficult. And that's where I think government has mm -hmm. to step in. Not all counties have the same resources. We know that we've known that for, you know, decades. Um, and it's not just the state of California. It really is all of the states. You have communities that are rural. You have communities that are urban. You don't find the same level of care resources. Or even if you think about it, um, you know, you've both referenced like geriatric care. It's different in different parts of, of the state. You, we can't assume that people in communities that are rural where it's harder to get to, um, you know, the, the resources will have uh, all of these opportunities to take advantage of. And then you have a serious cost of care, right? Serious, serious issue. And that's, I think, another conversation where, um, we, you know, it needs to be looked at. Um, sure, Medicare can pay for a portion of this, but what happens if Medicare is not enough um, for, you know, individuals? Um, and how do we, how, how do we fund that? Um, where does that come from? Um, do insurance plans cover some of this, none of this? I mean, Don, you mentioned you, you really, you thought, hey, I have insurance, 
we've checked off that box and you go figure that the, the plan in the cert, you know, of what's there is not actually enough. Uh, and and those, those are the kinds of conversations where I think we, we do have to step in. And, and we do this because it is one of the many issues that is facing millions of I individuals, right? Um, we are not a state nor we are a country that says we have these issues and we just, these health issues that have a deep impact and we just let each family or each person be. Uh, right now in this very moment that we're living, especially with the pandemic, we've had some of our toughest conversations about what the healthcare system needs to look like and where government steps in and where we don't. And certainly COVID-19 has brought some of this out, but when we start to go through a list in a different world outside of COVID-19, you have some of the same principles at, you know, at, at stake of just like, well, who cares? Who, who cares for the individuals, right? Um, that, that, that who's gonna provide the care for the individuals? Who's gonna pay for it? Or do we have the specialists? Do we have the physical structure in place? Um, you've talked a lot about the medication, right? Um, and not everyone knowing um, what to look out for and, and what conditions to treat. And so all of this is, I think, part of the greater conversations, the system conversations that the government is going to have to need to look at in order to invest in the right, right areas. Um, because this issue is also, I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking as you're talking, you know, can't, there must be a way to incentivize people at, in general to to pick up some of that burden of the of of the financial support in terms of business that can be that can flourish within this community that is necessary so maybe you know shining a light on what is needed and it doesn't not all of it has to be nonprofit there's not enough music there's not enough stimulation there's not enough because some people can't do exercise they're in a wheelchair they can't move what can we do to stimulate them what kind of programming can we bring them that might that as we do for children well, and I think uh, quality of care is always a conversation in any issue. And again, this is where I think government steps in, um, and, you know, to try to understand what is it that government can do um, and, and what government can't do. I don't believe that government can solve it all. Um, I just certainly think that it is a big enough issue. It impacts systems. So the government has to, in some way, take its, you know, understand its responsibility and role in trying to do better and trying to provide um, for the patients um, and the individuals who are suffering and also the families. I mean, for instance, I'm the sandwich generation. I had a 16 year old daughter when I moved my mom in, I'd just gone through a divorce and I, my, my career as a, a writer was taking off and I got hijacked because I was, I had to take care of my mom, and there was nothing I could turn to, uh, you know, as you know, to say I, well, I'm the caregiver. I did, I couldn't even get, you know, a tax deduction that year for taking care of my mom, as you can for a child. But those are things that could really help us, you know, as caregivers, you know. Right. Absolutely. And you've just identified exactly one of the things that does fall on, you know, on government. Uh, you know, something like a tax deduction. We have the child care, right, uh, deduction, and what does it look like um, for elders? Is it the same? Is it the same amount of time that you can claim it? Who claims it um, in situations where it's, you know, multiple siblings taking care of an elder? And so those are all of the elements um, that, you know, that come up. And the list goes on. Um, I think certainly uh, with the three of us on, we could keep talking about yes. all these unknowns, unexpected that keep coming up. And... The reality is, is it's not just for us three. It's for almost everyone that deals with this issue. And as we start to see millions of people deal with this issue, um, it becomes a topic that's more prevalent um, in the health space and in other spaces. I mean, that's something that's that's important to recognize, yeah. uh, that it's not just us three, three random people getting together, right, for a podcast that care. You have more and more people who are being impacted by dementia Alzheimer's. Um, and so you start to multiply what we think are individual, maybe little issues. And once they're multiplied to millions, they're no longer little, they're real big And like issues. you said, in one of the articles I was reading, you were saying about you know our, our dem the demographic of people who are 65 and over by, by 2013 is- 2030, you know, yeah. Huh? 2030, 2030, what did I say? Yeah. I don't know why I said that, but it's like, <laughs> 
how many did you say there was 8.65 or million or yeah yeah I mean it's it's a it's a it's a daunting amount of people that are going to be I mean that I believe that our 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 seniors will be the largest demographic at one point and and people are living longer and and even though it's Alzheimer's is not only a, an aging disease it is part of it does only come with age so that is so it's a it is it's something we're going to have we have to look at it we have to but do we you do. see yeah do you see the appetite for addressing this amongst your colleagues on both not only the state level but probably more importantly on the federal level you know as far as i'm concerned this should be part of the affordable care act this should all be part of of what you know this is a societal nationwide worldwide problem but it really is and will affect everyone more and more so what what is the appetite out there yeah and i will say that there there's definitely an appetite to address it where i think the challenge comes is how we prioritize it you will not find i believe um many legislators whether it's at the state level or at the federal level who won't you know as you talk to them who won't say that they don't that they just don't care that it's not important um where this competes is whether it becomes a top priority um and you have other issues that are compelling equally compelling um that are competing for that priority spot that's i think the challenge with public policy it's especially a challenge in 2020 it will especially be a challenge in 2021 because of the pandemic yeah. uh you have that is the number one issue no ands if or buts and it doesn't mean we don't have these other health responsibilities and health concerns that rise to a really high level it's that you know public policy doesn't know how to squeeze them all in in the middle of something else and that's one of the challenges that i've seen you know when i think back at the last four years where i've been doing work and legislating around this issue um it always came down to you know, how do we prioritize this? Right. You know, does it compete with diabetes? Does it compete with, you know, other concerns? Um, I mean, you name it on any other issue, right? Related yeah. to health and where do you find the funding for it? Right. Um, and that's, I think, where the challenge has been. But the more that we have consistent voices that are at the table saying this has to be something we deal with, um, I think uh, the better. I wish that sometimes in public policy space, we had the foresight to anticipate the impact that some issues will have on us mm -hmm. and do the work ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do that every once in a while. But at times, I do think that one of the flaws of um, the, the system we have is that we wait till the crisis hits us and then we turn our head and focus on it. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be a real big challenge because my fear, especially with dementia and Alzheimer's, is that when we decide to turn our head and focus on it, um, it will be so big and magnified to an extent that it will be so much harder to deal with. Well, it's, um, like, it's well, like COVID it's and like it's COVID. just like COVID, <laughs> you know, we waited and yeah. now, we're, now we're facing it. And, and when you do, maybe that's a lesson we can learn. I, I think what I would love to hear from you is, you know, before you we have to say goodbye is what can we do to help you? How can we as just, you know, we're not in the government, what can we do as citizens, as daughters and mothers and sisters and brothers and wives and husbands? How can we help you? I think one of the things that can be done that's very impactful, especially for someone like me as a state senator, and I think of my colleagues and legislators, is we need to hear your stories on a regular basis, not just on the one day a year where there's an advocacy day, right, for Alzheimer's. I think it has to be a constant. This is a health issue, it is a health priority, but unless we treat it like one where we're constantly talking to the elected officials, to you know the associations involved at the statewide levels, it can sometimes get put on the back burner, not because it's not important, but because it's just not a daily. And so I think that this is gonna be one of the issues um, that I would say we should all keep working on. We should all reach out to our state legislators, you know, reach out to your state senator, reach out to your state assembly person, reach out to your federal congressional representatives and make sure it's not just once a year, make sure it's on a regular basis um, to try to hear and, and, and make sure that they hear these stories, that they hear the realities, right? It's not just like a made up thing for one person 
Um, this is really the realities of millions. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we also, as association and as a group, a, a collective group that's working together, we need to put the data and the information together um, in, in a way that we don't stop, right? As we start telling people, 8 million people are gonna be impacted by this, it changes this, right? It's no longer just the three of us. It's, it's much more impactful. And I think that that's where the association, the Alzheimer's Association comes in, uh, not just the local chapters, but the statewide chapters and the national chapters of helping us make sure that when we tell our stories, those stories ref, you know, are realities. So we share our reality with all of the elected officials, but also that we bring to them the fact that it's, you know, evidenced by the fact that millions of people are going through this and then that we propose solutions to them. You know, as I've heard this conversation, I also was like, oh, at some point we're going to have to look at potentially a tax credit. But right. Why do I think that? Because we had this conversation, because in this conversation, we were able to identify something like this. And I'm not the only legislators. If we create these spaces to learn, to have a voice, for other legislators and for families, we're able to move the needle, maybe not, not as fast as yeah. we'd like, but move it just a tiny bit. Right. And with the hope that after so much moving of the needle, we'll start to see some serious change. Beautiful. What's the, and then in order to do that, we write letters, we write emails, we send and we be specific, correct? We do deep, we say this is what's happening and really tell your story, correct? Absolutely. And the best thing for California legislators is actually email. We all have a web portal. All 120 legislators in the state of California have a web portal. Um, and that web portal um, allows us to see real time data, real time information, real time, uh, you know, messages from our constituents. Beautiful. And so I always say that. But of course, it's, uh, it's very appropriate to set up meetings with your legislators uh, to be able to do some of this virtually. Um, you know, in 2020, likely in 2021 virtually, uh, but to have these conversations with your legislator on a Zoom or something like that, that so that they can that? hear and see us. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, who knew that? Because I mean, <laughs> I mean, take advantage of the technology, everybody. Yeah, I mean, because you always hear call. Yeah, we always hear call your senator. It's like, well, if, in my mind, wow. we'll call and they'll and they'll you'll be a, a recording a, a, or someone yeah. will take a message and that'll be it. You know, so, you know, I there are other I ways. I hope you get bombarded by everyone. That's <laughs> I, hope, I hope. Yeah, let's. Honestly, it's the squeaky wheel, right? That's how I got my mom into the place she's at. It takes, it takes, you know, some banging of the pots and pans and drums and whatever you can do. <laughs> wow. I'm so, I'm so inspired. Thank you so, so much. I, I would love to have you back again at some point here. You know, I know you're going to make so much movement in this area and I'm so proud of you and proud to know you. And thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Susie. No, yeah. thank you, Dawn. And thanks for doing this, right? Just in the same way that you are you know looking at ways that you can bring your reality and your voice to state legislators mm -hmm. i appreciate this podcast because it's a way to bring our collective voice to the broader public right yeah. um, and, and so i think that that's also really important um, it's not just between those impacted and state legislators but we start to have a broader conversation uh, to help those that might someday have to face the reality of what it means to take care of a loved one who has dementia or Alzheimer's. 100%. We're just going to close it up, Don. What did we always say? That love is powerful, love is contagious, and love conquers all. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so, so much. We're, we're rooting. Thank you. We're your biggest fans. Okay. <laughs> take care.